Want to stand? We will say our prayer and then begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, O Heavenly King, comfort the Spirit of Truth, word of what prevails to all things, the treasury of good things, and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. All right. Get this closer. We have another map for tonight's class as a handout. Take one and back. Tonight we are talking, I've altered kind of my schedule. I was overly optimistic about what I would cover. I was going to try to cover the churches, the church in Armenia, uh, or, or Christianity in Armenia, uh, in the country of Georgia. This is all in the uh, Caucasus area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Um, and then also the church, Christianity in Ethiopia and Egypt. And tonight we're just talking about Georgia. I got through five pages of notes and thought I'll never be able to cover more <laughs> in an hour with what I got. So that's okay. Your map is roughly the time period of the 12th into the 13th century of the Kingdom of Georgia. Um, this is pulled off of Wikipedia, uh, the map itself. Uh, I think it's entry on the, the, the uh, nation of Georgia. Georgia, I think we still have a... Our map here, in terms of reference, so of course Rome, Greece, Constantinople, this is Asia, what is modern day Turkey, the Black Sea is up here, and so what you have on your map is the other end of the Black Sea. So the Black Sea extends, Crimea sits here, and then up into Ukraine and Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, and so forth. Other side of the Black Sea is Georgia, country of Georgia, as well as modern day Armenia, and then Azerbaijan um, is next to that, and then Iran is below Azerbaijan uh, and below the Caspian Sea. Um, so, this is the area of the world we're talking about. According to tradition, the Apostle Andrew the first called, whose feast day is tomorrow. We celebrated Great Vespers tonight for the Apostle Andrew. Um, tradition says that he preached in Georgia in the first century. Additionally, tradition speaks to the preaching of other apostles in Georgia, including Simon the Canaanite, Matthias, Bartholomew, and Thaddeus. The establishment of the first Georgian diocese was also attributed to the Apostle Andrew, but the size of the church was um, small to the point of not taking much historical notice until the uh, fourth century. And we covered this in lecture three, um, the missionizing of the Georgian royal court and the people of Georgia by the slave, girl, the slave girl Nino, or Nina, St. Nina, enlightener of the, the, um, of the Georgians. She, again, was from the Cappadocian region, which is in the center of modern-day Turkey. She was captured, enslaved by the Georgians, also called the Iberians. Um, in captivity, she lived a holy life. This resulted in and the nobility taking notice of her, especially during the time of sickness, 
um, when the queen had her servants uh, take her to Nina's dwelling, uh, she prayed, and the queen herself, who was sick, was instantly healed. And it's from this that then her uh, work really begins um, in expanding the, the Christian faith throughout Georgia. So, so the Georgian people, in terms of the other religious influences that they, you know, this is Christianity is a choice that they make. Um, in a sense, the thing that they were rejecting largely is what is called Zoroastrianism, which has its origins in what is modern day Iran. Um, many people associate this with fire worship, uh, but it's more than that. Zoroastrianism dates back to around the 6th century BC and possibly before. Um, it is not old, as old as Judaism. Um, of course, that predates it, um, but it has similar, it's a monotheistic religion, and there are similarities between it and uh, the, the religion of the Israelites, we should say, um, of that period, because you don't have Judaism per se until uh, much closer to um, the time of Christ and after the second, during the second temple period, you can say that the, you have the emergence of Judaism because it's only the uh, kingdom of Judah that <laughs> endures exile uh, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and returns to the promised land. And that's when you have this chain, in a sense, the, the tribe of Judah is the prompt predominant tribe. And thus the name Jew comes from the tribe of Judah. So I get all that correct, Deacon Michael? Deacon Michael's a one of our uh, experts, local experts on Judaism. So the Georgians are rejecting Zoroastrianism from the east, from Iran, what is modern-day Iran. And this is going on in the 4th century in the 300s, the early 300s. And from this point onwards, the outlook of the people um, is towards the west, uh, towards the Roman world, especially in western Georgia but also in eastern Georgia that was much closer to Iran. Um, in eastern Georgia, you had several kings or principalities. It wasn't one unified kingdom at this point in the 300s. You had princes. And they had principalities. Um, you had a western Georgian kingdom and an eastern Georgian kingdom. That stretched, as the map shows, um, if you kind of see, there's a river or several rivers here that kind of run through the country. Um, Western Georgia, kingdom, the Western Georgian kingdom is, of course, on the west. On the Black Sea, the Eastern Georgian kingdom spreads towards the Caspian Sea. Um, this had been a crossroads between the east and the west for a long time between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, and then between the Roman Empire and the Mongol, or is, and then Islamic empires that come afterwards. Uh, from the sixth century, the Western Georgian kingdom was ecclesiastically united to Constantinople. It was under Constantinople and followed the liturgical traditions that were predominant in Constantinople. The exception of the services were done largely in Georgian, the native language of the people. They have a very unique script as well. Very squiggly, it looks like, to like an English reader. It's very squiggly, very, very kind of foreign. Not straight lines and nice, normal, round letters. Much more squiggly. And so to our eyes, it looks very different. Very different. <coughs> Hebrew is much more boxy, right, in its, in its letters. Um, and, and Greek is angular and so forth. And, but uh, Georgian is very, very fluid and very much like, like you have a cursive E with those loops, a lot of loops in Georgian. So it's very, very different, very beautiful. 
So basically, it's the state of the school, not picking it up at all. Yeah. Writing. Yeah, it seems like it. So, um, they have, so their own language, their own script, and that was the language of the services was in Georgian. The Eastern Kingdom, though, was united to our church, the Church of Antioch, Patriarchate of Antioch. It's from Antioch, also in the 4th or the 5th century, the 400s, that a number of, um, I think it's 13 Syrian fathers, go to Georgia to help um, in the education and the missionizing of the Georgian people. And um, the, the first, what we call the, the senior bishop in the church in Georgia, has a very unique name. He's called the Katholikos, from the word Catholic. Catholic means whole or complete. Okay. It has a second meaning of universal, but it's more predominant meaning. It's, it's more major or kind of primary meaning is the meaning of being complete or whole. Um, and so uh, the Orthodox in the East would use the word Catholic as we use in the, in, because it's descriptive that, of the nature of the church. The, the church is complete. It's whole. It's not lacking anything. And you find it everywhere. That's the second meaning. But the first meaning is the completeness. So a Catholicos, right? He's the he's the that that sense of wholeness or, and so forth is kind of used in this title, I believe, um, of in a sense what we would say is the patriarch of the Church of Georgia, but his title is the Catholicos. So. Um, the first Catholicos was consecrated by the Patriarch of Antioch in the 5th century in this Eastern Georgian kingdom. From early on, you have a strong Georgian presence in Jerusalem. And one of the reasons I wanted to kind of just spend the whole evening just on Georgia, because it's, it's one of the, it, we're somewhat familiar with it in the Orthodox world, um, in the United States. There's not a lot of churches of the Georgian uh, church here. Um, but it's something that we kind of have in our frame of reference, but we don't know probably much about it. And so um, it has a very rich history. And one of the elements is how the Georgians established uh, religious communities, not just in Georgia, not in the country of Georgia, um, but in other places, particularly Jerusalem. The first monastery uh, of Georgian monks founded in Jerusalem was founded in the 400s, very early on. The Georgian prince Peter the Iberian, who dies in 488, founded the first Georgian religious community in Jerusalem. And you had a very strong tradition of pilgrimage to Jerusalem from Georgia throughout its history. Um, also, you have the founding of the monastery of Aviron on Mount Athos. And remember, Mount Athos is the third finger um, up in the, the north of Greece, the third peninsula there. That's what is Mount Athos. On the end of it is the mountain Athos. Um, and on that peninsula, you had the formation of a monastic um, Republic, basically, where the peninsula is divided up into by, by 20 different monasteries. They control those, each of those monasteries controls a, a, a specific part of that peninsula. Um, the third of those monasteries historically is the monastery of Aviron, founded by Georgians. And this is in roughly 979, 980. I've been to that monastery. I spent several weeks there when I was in seminary. And so um, it sits right on the northern coast of the peninsula. It's a big square castle like structure. The, 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 it comes up out of the ground and there's no, in, there on the kind of ground level, there are no windows. There are no doors. Uh, because pirates, real pirates, of course, would come and raid the monasteries, not just Vikings. Um, 
the Turkish pirates and, and Venetian pirates and, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and so monasteries on Malthus were built like fortresses to protect the people who live there. And so it rises up, you know, multiple stories up this big square, somewhat square edifice. And as you get higher, there's windows because in a sense, the, 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 the wall, they're not walls. The buildings form the walls around the monastery. And in the center is the church, um, which is over a thousand years old. Uh, the floor itself is over a thousand years old. And it's likely built on the, on the ruins of a pagan temple. So Athos had been even a place of uh, pagan ritual kind of practices going back long, long ago. When I was there, we took a hike around the, the tip of the peninsula and then back up the southern side. And we climbed one of the lesser peaks of the mountain dedicated to St. Elias. And on the top of that peak is a chapel, a small chapel dedicated to the prophet Elijah or Elias in Greek or Eli, right? It's all the same name. Um, and next to the, the chapel is this massive piece of stone, uh, which they had some uh, solar panels strapped to, actually. But as you go down the stone, there are basins carved into it with a hole coming out of the side. And all of these areas um, these small areas dug into the ground, like kind of miniature cisterns that hold water. Because in uh, when you do animal sacrifice, you need a place to, in a sense, drain the blood and capture the blood. And so this structure, this this sink in the stone with a hole coming out of it, was the way of draining the blood out of the animal and catching it. But then also having water on the top of a mountain from rain to wash the animal clean to prepare it to be offered. Because the killing of the animal is not part of the ritual. You just have to get the parts of the animal you need for the ritual, so thus you have to kill it. But the killing is not ritualized usually. So, but those, the top of the mountain had been a pagan, a place of pagan sacrifice. So, uh, that's it rabbit trail but we'll come back to our <laughs> we'll come back to the georgians um the two kingdoms georgian kingdoms um as well as their churches western and eastern were then uh separate until the 11th century when they were united under bagrat the third who reigned from 975 to 1014 I know that English monarchy has this nice long claim of monarchs going back a long time. You, but you still, you still have a living descendant of Bagrat III in Georgia. He's not officially the king. He's not recognized. But he is a male descendant of this, this, this man um, that... that founded this dynasty and united the two kingdoms and that that dynasty basically re governed Georgia for a thousand years or 800 years until it was kind of assumed in the Russian empire. So, and we'll come back to that at the end. Um, so in 1008, the, the, the two kingdoms are united in 1010. The Catholicos was, uh, the churches were united as well, and the Catholicos in 1010 was granted the title of patriarch by the other churches. So the ecclesiastical union uh, was retained until the 13th century with, with, um, when there was a split between the two kingdoms, the one kingdom back into two and in multiple kingdoms, and the church also, in a sense, divided ecclesiastically. They didn't break communion, but you had two separate churches under the two separate kingdoms. And that, uh, and we'll get to why that was in a little bit. Um, the Church of Georgia has been one of the constant aspects of Georgian history for the last thousand years. Um, and before that, the Catholicos is the senior bishop of the Georgian church in the 11th century until the Mongol invasion. He was recognized as the spiritual king of the nation. 
rather unique. All major bishops and abbots were also counted as temporal princes of the kingdom and sat on the council of state. Now, this might sound similar to what was going on in Western Europe. Um, and there is some crossover, but they're not identical. Um, this did not mean that the monarchy, though, controlled the church. The aristocracy, which included then the bishops and abbots, often acted as a check against monarchical power. So that the nobility, in a sense, could operate autonomous from the monarchy. You know, they, they, there was a system of governance where you had a monarch, but the nobility played a major role, and the, and the bishops of the church were included in that aspect. Um, they did not follow the West in terms of the, the bishops and the abbots taking up arms or leading armies and those kind of aspects that you do find in the West, nor does the abbots and the bishops, are they granted, in a sense, their, uh, their diocese or their monasteries from the king directly. It still comes through the church, so you don't have that aspect as you did have in the West. So, But they are a part of, in a sense, the governmental structure. Um, and so strong monarchs could dismiss hierarchs and control ecclesiastical elections, but only with great difficulty. Only with difficulty. And so in the 12th, 11th, 12th, and 13th century, you have two monarchs that stand out in the history of Georgia. King David II, who reigned from 1089 to 1125, and he is referred to as the restorer and the rebuilder. He had uh, a number of military victories over the predominant Muslim powers in the region, and he established a multinational, uh, multi-ethnic empire throughout the Caucasus. And the map is, is showing you, in a sense, the results of David II, as well as when we get to Queen tomorrow. This is the, the, the context of now what I'm talking about, this, this map. He was devoted to a strong and vibrant monastic presence in the kingdom, endowing monasteries with land and exemptions from taxes. Monasteries also became centers for learning. Monks were sent to Mount Athos for the purpose of translating ecclesiastical texts. He increased education, secular and religious, establishing numerous schools. He tried to reconcile the Armenians back to unity with the Orthodox Church. In a later lecture, we'll talk about the Armenians and how they uh, went into schism after the Third Ecumenical Council. Um, and these are, the Armenians reside kind of south of Georgia. And at this point, a lot of Armenia is a part of the kingdom of Georgia. And so his efforts were to, he did not impose orthodoxy on the Armenians, but he attempted very vigorously to reconcile them back to the, to, to the church. He called the Synod of uh, Ruisi Urbnisi in 1103, and I'm sure I but butchered that name with my American accent, so I don't speak Georgian, unfortunately. Um, and this is the most famous of synods in Georgian history. And the king participated. He presided over the synod. Um, a number of things that was addressed in the synod was, one, simony, the buying of ecclesiastical office, was addressed num numerous times, condemning it. Uh, proper canonical age for ordination was reaffirmed. How old do you have to be to be a deacon? Does anybody know? 23. Because there is an age, a canonical age. Paul? Deacon knows. Oh, Deacon Michael? Does Deacon Michael know? You've met the age requirement. Yeah. 23 is closed. 25. You have to be canonically 25 to be a deacon, 30 to be a priest, 35 to be a bishop. Those numbers should sound familiar because to be a member of the House of Representatives, you have to be 25 be a senator, you have to be 30. 
to run for president, you have to be 35. Where did the U.S. government get that? From canonical legislation of the church. That's where it comes from. So, you know, they say there's this separation of church and state, you know, whatever, you know. They pulled many things actually from the church. So as inspiration for uh, the founding of our country. So Maybe they should <laughs> yes. He also, the synod also addressed a number of corrupt bishops and bishops who were found to be corrupt and immoral were removed from office by the synod and replaced with men who were worthy to, to hold the office of bishop. Marriages and baptisms were affirmed to be performed only in the church. So this the practice of giving in a church temple, having the baptism in the church temple, right? This is not a uh, unusual kind of orthodox practice of, of recent years. This is something that is ancient. This is where you got married. And so the synod, uh, the synod of 1103 is reaffirming these things because there were people who were breaking that, in a sense, doing marriages or baptisms other places. Um, and so if you want to get married in our archdiocese, but you want to get married on the beach or the lake, or at the country club, or whatever that is, um, you have to have express written permission from the Metropolitan, and who will only give it out of excessive need, which pretty much means zero chance. <laughs> so just FYI for those planning on uh, getting married soon. So uh, marriages to heretics or to non-Christians that you're not supposed to marry heretics or non-Christians was also affirmed. And the marriage age for women was addressed. That women should be met, mar should be given in marriage at a proper age, not too young, right? So this was one of the concerns that women, girls were being married off at too early of an age. The age that was set though, is gonna sound, I think somewhat scandalous to us, but 12 was the age. It was, they have to be at least 12. So, which in the ancient world, it was much more common for girls once they hit puberty than to be betrothed and wed. So for us, 18 seems like as young as it could be. And even that seems ridiculous. Like, oh, you, have to, you should be in your 20s at least, right? Um, so the kind of sensibilities of the time were different than what we have so but this was a concern that you know girls too young were being mistreated or being given a marriage and that this was was inappropriate in the time of queen tamara this is 1184 to 1212 this is when she reigns she reigns as sole monarch of georgia okay um she is the great Great, she is the great granddaughter of David II. She ruled a multinational empire, one of the most powerful in the Near East of its time. Her empire included the entirety of the Caucasus, the southern coast of the Black Sea, most of Armenia and Iranian Azerbaijan. She had good relations with Saladin, who was the Sultan, uh, the, the Ottoman Sultan, who himself upon regaining Jerusalem, returned properties to, to Georgia that the Georgian church had had before the time of the Crusades. Because again, remember the Crusaders from the West came in and they did not distinguish very much between Muslim and Christian. They seized what they wanted. And that included properties that had been the Church of Georgia's. Um, and so these were returned by the Muslim leader who retook Jerusalem back to the Georgians because they had good relations with each other. Georgian nobility um, 
had been united to Roman nobility, meaning Roman nobility of Constantinople, um, through marriage with the Komneni dynasty of Constantinople. At the fall of Constantinople to the Crusaders in 1204, Queen Tamara sent her armies to occupy Trebizond. And you see it, the city of Trebizond on your map. So I've always thought is a, you know, these are it's one of those kind of, um, in my mind, Trebizond is one of those kind of far, far away kind of mysterious places, right? The name itself, Trebizond, you know, evokes kind of mystery and, and so forth. Um, but uh, she sent her armies to occupy Trebizond because this had been a part of the Roman Empire based in Constantinople. Um, and, and its surrounding territories. Her kinsman then, Alexis I Comenus, was installed as the first sovereign uh, of, a, of what becomes known as the Grand Comenoi. Uh, and that's what's called the, the uh, Trebizond, the Kingdom of Trebizond on the map. Um, it, that king kingdom endures until 1461 as a, an independent kingdom subject to the kings and queens of Georgia. So again, you had in, in, in the, this time in the world and before, you had, you had multiple kings and princes and dukes and so forth, right? Um, but you had monarchs who were, in a sense, in obedience or subjects of other monarchs, just like the, you know, a king would have princes, dukes, barons, and so forth in the West, right? You would have kings who were subjects of emperors or, or princes subjects of kings. And so this structure, it, does, it wasn't just in the Christian world. This is also how it worked in the Islamic world. The sultan was the top, like the emperor. And, and when the sultan conquered you, he didn't get rid of your government necessarily. He just made you his subject. And you had to pay him, basically, and do what he says. He didn't like you. No. But this is how the, the things were structured in terms of government. So the, emp the, the kingdom of Trebizond, or the Grand Komenoi, survives until 1461. The monasteries in Georgia were major cultural centers. They functioned as missionary agencies and outposts contributing to the spread of the faith. And this is very much a, a pattern within the Orthodox Church. We, we don't, um, you know, modern, modern history in terms of how missions, missionaries and missions works um, from a Protestant standpoint is its own unique historical reality. Um, it, it has its own origins, its own history. We'll cover some of that in other lectures. But... Um, it's not the only manner in which missionizing missions were done. Uh, historically, uh, as we see here, often the missionaries were the monks. They were the kind of the Marines, the first to land, to go into an area, right? And to encounter people and, and through the, the, the monks, right? The, the faith was expanded which makes sense because a, a monastic is somebody who's dedicated their whole life to the worship of God and to prayer and to the understanding of the scriptures. Uh, and so they are the ones who are um, most ideally suited in a sense to, to answer questions, right? They live a life of prayer and of, and of, of self-sacrifice, right? And so, They've, they've deeply entered into the faith so they can express it and understand it and explain it from their own experience. Um, and so the monastics often are, even if this is not their primary goal, they function as kind of the, the forefront of the church and its mission. Um, the, mon the monasteries also contributed to the literary flowering of the 11th and 12th centuries. Georgian literature includes translations from Greek, Armenian, Armenian, Syriac, and Arabic. And so they would bring in works from all these languages. There's, a, there's many, many ancient texts 
right, that we know of that were written in Greek or Arabic or another le or, uh, Hebrew, let's say. But the only reason we have a copy of it is because somebody translated it into Georgian. And that's what we have. We have the Georgian copy of it because they were so prolific in translating things. Um, the renewal of the 11th and 12th centuries was contributed to by many monastic communities outside of Georgia, found in the Near East, Palestine, Mount Sinai, Bithynia, Antioch, the Balkans, and the Anthonite Peninsula. Not only in their own communities did you find Georgian monks, but you found them also in any of the monasteries of these areas because they were, Georgia never split away from the rest of the Orthodox Church. Georgians could inhabit monasteries in any of these regions, in the Middle East, in Greece, and so forth. So not only monks, but also laypersons traveled outside of Georgia. Numerous officials in Constantinople were Georgian, along with soldiers <coughs> and military officials. The general Gregory uh, Pacurianus is one of the most notable from the 11th century. He founded a monastery, he's a general, and in his retirement, he founds a monastery in Thrace, which is a region of Greece. It is populated by Georgians who are war veterans who fought with him. So they, they, they retire from being soldiers and they go to the monastery. And then this monastery exists to this day, but it's now inhabited by Bulgarians, actually. Um, so, the, you know, you have the, the Church of Georgia, the Kingdom of Georgia, but the people of Georgia themselves were able to spread out, just very much like the Greeks, kind of go where they could, you know, um, for different various reasons. But all of this contributed, in a sense, to the, the cultural richness of Georgia itself and to the church itself. It was very much, this is the picture I, I hope you're kind of taking away here, is of um, this Black Sea region that's very much incorporated into the Mediterranean world. It's not like it's, it's cut off in the 11th, 12th century at all. Like, they are intricately tied in with with the, the, the Christian world of the Western and Eastern Mediterranean and the people of Georgia are intricately in, intertwined with the Roman Empire based in Constantinople. The, the intermarrying of the royal families um, was common, um, as well as, again, government officials going back and forth and having ecclesiastical ties and so forth between all of them. Um, but by, the, by 1220, you start to have a change. The Mongols had invaded and placed Georgia under its authority. The kingdom did not end, but was subject to the Mongols. Latin missionaries arrived at the end of the invasion, at the end of the Mongol invasion, to missionize among the Orthodox Georgians. By 1329, a Latin bishopric had been established in the Georgian capital of uh, Tiflis which on your map, that's the one with the big dot and the white center. That's the capital of Georgia. The papacy could bless the conversion of Orthodox Georgians to, to Roman Catholicism, but they could not provide any assistance against the Mongol aggression. Tamerlane in 1386 brought wholesale slaughter and devastation to the region. Tamerlane or Timur is a, uh, a Turkish, uh, a, he is of Turkish and Mongol ancestry. He saw himself as the heir of Genghis Khan, and he established a very powerful empire over this region in his day. He is considered to be a, a brilliant military tactician, um, but a brutal man, brutal. Um, and so Georgia suffered under Tamerlan at this time. Georgian representatives were present at the Council of Florence in 1439. This is the council that attempted to reunite uh, the, 
uh, Western Christianity with Eastern Christianity. Um, and again, we haven't covered this directly, but the kind of the, the terms of agreement were basically the uh, acceptance of Rome supremacy, of papal supremacy and jurisdiction over all churches and all kingdoms. Because it was a it was a claim of jurisdiction not over just the church, but also of princely power that both come through the Bishop of Rome. Um, and in a sense, and so that was always kind of this is there was never a it was never a question of of having a discussion or having a, a compromise or an agreement or coming to some kind of consensus. It, it the the in a sense, the councils of union were always you accept our terms or you get or nothing. And so the 1439 the council is being held because the threat of Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. The emperor of Constantinople is pressing for union with the hope of Western armies coming to help. Um, the union was signed. The bishops, the Greek bishops, were forced to sign by the emperor. They all, for the most part, repudiated their signatures. The Georgians were there, but they didn't sign. So they were involved in all of this, but they refused to sign. And no military help really ever came. Beside the point. So, but that's that'll be an, another lecture. We'll cover all that. By the 15th century, it was the Ottomans who were imposing their will on Georgia. This fragmented the country into three kingdoms under the uh, Bagratid royal family. The same royal family was over each of these principalities. And that those three kingdoms splintered into five. Um, subject to the Ottomans, it was easier for the Ottomans to have multiple princes over multiple smaller little kingdoms that they could more easily control than one united kingdom, which would then have a one bigger united force of resistance to them. So it was to their advantage to see them break up and fight within themselves. And the Ottomans were masters at this, making, in a sense, their enemies fight each other. It was then in 1801 that the Russian Empire incorporated this territory into its own kingdom. In 1811, the Church of Georgia was united or dissolved and made a part of this, the Church of Russia. Following the 1917 February Revolution, the Georgian hierarchs unilaterally announced the restoration of the Church of Georgia and autocephaly, self-governance. This was not accepted by the Church of Russia, and the Soviet forces went further regarding all Orthodox and Soviet territory to be subject to their rule. Thus, the Church of Georgia was har harassed and churches and other church activities were closed. Clergy, monks, and Christians in general were killed in the ensuing purges of the next several decades. And again, the Soviet or the, um, the Bolshevik per, uh, persecution of the church took more lives of Christians than any other persecution of the church before it or since. So with the recognition of the Orthodox Church by Stalin, do you know this history? In the midst of World War II, Stalin recognized the church and allowed the church more freedom um, as a means of galvanizing the people in the midst of World War II. And it's seen um, by many in, 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 in the former Soviet Union, that that was the thing that turned the tide of the war, because again, again, we're Americans. We don't, we don't, we we get the story of World War II from the British, the French, and the, our own kind of memory, right? Uh, the majority of the fighting of World War II was on the Eastern Front, the front po uh, facing the Soviets. Um, the Germans pressed in to the Soviet Union all the way to Stalingrad. And at the Battle of Stalingrad, it's then that the Germans were first defeated and started pushing back. Um, 
And by the time you get to D-Day, when we finally land on the mainland of, 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 of Europe, um, the Russians in many ways had already defeated the Germans. And they lost 20 million people in the process. So the Soviets, the Russians. The Russians lost 20 million people in World War II, which is more than what the Germans lost or anyone else lost or anyone else lost combined, I think. So they, the, the Soviets took the brunt of German aggression um, and, and bore the brunt of that slaughter um, and, and uh, in a sense, pushed the Germans back eventually. Um, and it was only because the Soviets were on the march that we needed to land to try to get to Berlin before they did because we didn't trust them. And then after, of course, World War II, you know, you have the division, the, the, the Warsaw, the division of, of the East and the West and the Iron Curtain and all these things, right? Because we, we were suspicious of one another. So, but in terms of the people themselves, it was the Russian people that took the, the far bigger brunt of World War II. And that's why in Russia to this day, it's still considered a much bigger deal. It's still remembered in a much more... Uh, impactful way that we remember it because everyone lost somebody in world war ii everyone so um but it's many have said it's because the churches were given freedom that the tide of the, the war changed um the church and from that point on the churches were much more free the church in in, in the soviet union was much more free um and this was done to gain support of the church for repulsing the invasion of the Germans. Um, part of the current conflict even goes back, and Ukraine goes back to, to this period, the World War II, because you had a significant minority in Western Ukraine that welcomed the Germans as liberators from the Soviets. Um, and they fought alongside the Germans. And I don't know if you recall, one of these men who's still alive today was given a standing ovation in the Canadian parliament a few months ago. But the unit he was a part of that was a Ukrainian unit was a Ukrainian SS unit. And so you have in Western Ukraine specifically a strain of Ukrainians that very much idolized and embraced what the Germans were bringing, um, and not just with liberation, but also ideology. And that didn't go away um, in Western Ukraine, even to this day. So you will see on some of the soldiers, very similar uh, uh, symbols on their patches as the German armies had under the Fuhrer on theirs. So it's a very complicated, messy history. Um, it's not completely this black and white kind of uh, reality going on, unfortunately. So, but the, Ger the Georgians, right, are in, in a part of all of this uh, history um, having been a part of the Soviet Union. Um, and so the autocephaly of the Church of Georgia was recognized by the Soviet Union and the Church of Russia in 1943. Then in 1989, the autocephaly was recognized by the Patriarch of Constantinople and thus approving the de facto autocephaly that had been exercised by the Georgians really since the 5th century. The current Catholicos, and this is where we'll end, of Georgia is Ilya II, who became Catholicos in 1977. He's still alive. I think he's the longest reigning hierarch in the Orthodox Church. Okay? So, but this, his life kind of gives us a picture of what the church in Georgia had been brought to by the Soviets. 
Okay. So after becoming the first hierarch, the Catholicos, Patriarch Ilya began implementation of reforms that enabled the Church of Georgia to regain much of its former influence and prestige, uh, attributes that it had before it was pressed by the Soviet Union. In 1917, before the Bolshevik Revolution, there had been 2,455 active churches in Georgia. In the early 80s, there were 80, 80 parishes that were functioning. By 1988, the number of priests in the Church of Georgia, and so that means that literally there were like 80 priests in this whole country, roughly, or more. And by 1988, so about 11 years after he's Catholicoast, the Church of Georgia had grown to 180 priests with a monastic community of 40 monks, one monastic community of 40 monks, and a monastic community of 15 nuns in 1988. That's how it recovered. The community of faithful was variously estimated as being between one and three million. There also were about then 200 churches served by those 180 clergy. A seminary, one seminary, um, and then seven monasteries, three female and four male. During the 1980s, Patriarch Ilya actively engaged himself in the social life of Georgia. He participated on April 9th, 1989, with the Georgian people in demonstrations in Tbilisi against the Soviet rule. As their demonstrations became heated, Patriarch Ilya unsuccessfully urged the protesters to withdraw to the nearby uh, Kashueti Church to avoid bloodshed. This peaceful demonstration, however, was dispersed by the Soviet troops who left behind 22 dead and hundreds injured. In the early 1990s, as the Soviet Union was falling apart, he called on the rival political parties within Georgia to find a peaceful solution to the internal crisis during the civil war that broke out in Georgia. In 2006, the Church of Georgia reported having 30 dioceses, 1,004 parishes, 65 monasteries, and of the 4,400,000 citizens of Georgia, 80% now identified as Orthodox. He has been a proponent of a constitutional monarchy as the form of government for Georgia. In his sermon on October 7, 2007, he publicly called for consideration of establishing a constitutional monarchy under the Bra uh, Bagratonian dynasty, that same dynasty that I talked about earlier. A dynasty that the Russian Empire had dispossessed of the Georgian crown early in the 19th century. This statement coincided with a rising confrontation between the government of Georgia, President Mikhail Saakashvili, and the opposition that included many members who welcomed the Patriarch's proposal. Saakashvili, I believe, would have to flee the country over claims of corruption, and he came back and he was arrested eventually. During the Russian-Georgian War of 2008, Patriarch Ilya II appealed to the Russian political leadership and church, expressing concerns that the Orthodox Russians were bombing Orthodox Georgians, and dismissed the Russian accusations of Georgia's genocide in South Ossetia as a pure lie. He also made a pastoral visit to the Russian-occupied central Georgian city of Gori and the surrounding villages bringing food and aid to an area on the verge of humanitarian catastrophe. He also helped retrieve bodies of deceased Georgian soldiers and civilians. Patriarch Ilya II also blessed the September 1, 2008 Stop Russia demonstrations in which tens of thousands of organized, they organized a human chains across Russia or across Georgia. In December of 2008, Patriarch Ilya visited Moscow to pay a final farewell to the Russia's late Patriarch Alexei II. In December, 2008, he met Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, which was the first high-level official contact between the two countries since the August War. Later, Patriarch Ilya announced 
that he had some positive agreements with Medvedev that needed careful and diplomatic follow-up by the politicians. In 2007, Patriarch Ilya II spurred a baby boom in the nation by opting to personally baptize any third child or more born to a couple. After his uh, after he that he initiated this, the result was a national baby boom, because being baptized by the patriarch is seen as a huge honor in Georgia. The country's birth rate increased by 20% in 2008. And he has continued this practice to this day. Quarterly, he will baptize a mass baptism. All these infants that are the third or fourth or fifth child of a couple, they'll register and they'll come, they'll bring their children. He will baptize them. So to have the bishop baptize your baby is seen as kind of a, a, a great blessing. And especially if he's the the senior bishop of the whole church, right? Because the birth rate of Georgia was going like this. And he wanted people to have bigger families. So it, the third child, right? So you have to have two at least. The third or the fourth or the, you know, and so forth. And so, and so Patriarch Ilya is still living to this day in the Kotol Kos of Georgia. So, uh, questions? <laughs> Paul. How old does the patriarch have to be if he, when he becomes patriarch? Good question. How old does a patriarch have to be to become a patriarch? The patriarch is a title for a bishop. So he has to be 35. 30. Unless the constitution of the church, the local church, dictates something different. But the patriarch is the title of, of the senior bishop of the of a, of a church. Not every church has a patriarch. Sometimes they have an archbishop or a metropolitan. So, but 35 is the canonical age for um, uh, for being uh, or, uh, elected a bishop. So, uh, any other questions? Paul. How old are you? <laughs> old enough to be a priest. Old enough to be your dad. Because yes. I am your dad. <laughs> you should know my age. Let's say I, I've been alive roughly as long as Ilya the second has been patriarch. What's your birthday? <laughs> Last that is classified information. So. Yeah. And so I um the so the Church of Georgia has had a huge explosion um since the 70s. Like it was decimated to a very small uh minority of clergy and and, and, and churches and so forth, but under Patriarch Ilya has been this massive explosion um to the point where the majority of the country identifies as Orthodox and participates one extent or another in the, the liturgical life of the church um in uh in during covid I, I remember seeing some video from georgia they were very proactive in what they were doing in, to, to allow us uh, liturgical services in the midst of covid and i remember watching this video where you, you had these this beautiful ancient church and they had a sound system set up for the outside and six feet separated, you had these chairs outside surrounding the church, right? And this is this is not necessarily a warm climate country in the winter, right? This is Georgia is a very mountainous place, um, and so but the people were there six feet apart outside, and they would go in to the church for communion, uh, uh, but they were very proactive in keeping the churches open through all of that struggle. Um, and uh, it's a, uh, they have some, some very beautiful traditions and some, you know, their own kind of distinct uh, customs and so forth uh, that um, are unique to, to, to Georgia itself. So 
All right. Next week, we're going to try to cut, not next week, because next week is St. Nicholas Day. So we will be having the visit of St. Nicholas. He's going to read a story to the kids. We'll see if they get treats in their shoes and so forth, as we usually do. Um, and then in, so in two weeks, we'll come back and we'll be discussing Christianity in Armenia, Christianity in Ethiopia, in Egypt, in the Sub-Sahara Africa. Um, and that'll be our next topic. So God bless you all. See you in a couple weeks.